all this? <clears throat> Exhibit A. The volume of books an average student can expect to read in pursuit of a four-year degree. Impressive. Oh, yeah. Oh, look, it's my old geology book. Oh, and isn't that... <laughs> it is. It's Pride and Prejudice. I love that book. You know, but somehow I don't remember textbooks being so heavy. <sighs> well, I thought you worked out. I do. I did. Okay, well, I'm here now, Wayne. I, you know, I guess I could use a little more muscle. Well, you could always curl up with a good book. For many people, reading is one of life's greatest pleasures. There's nothing like getting lost in a good book. But let's face it, who has time to enjoy Moby Dick if you've got 30 pages of history and 40 pages of biology to read before next week? Not to mention having to remember it all in order to pass a test. One good solution is muscle reading, a tool that will help you get the most out of every minute you spend with the written word. Muscle reading is a nine-step process called Pokrua, triple R. Pokrua? Nice word, isn't it? Just kind of slips off the tongue as Pokrua. Oh. Yeah. Pokrua. Pokrua. It stands for the first six steps of muscle reading. Preview, outline, questions, read, underline, answer. Well, Pokrua is followed by a triple R, recite, review, and review again. You can apply the steps of muscle reading to almost any assignment, but it's especially good for helping you get the most out of your textbooks. This means you can get better grades with about the same amount of study time. But you'll also find muscle reading will help you succeed after college and throughout your career. Spot me. How about some more weight, Wayne? What? Ah, ah, ow, take him off, take him off, take him off. Ah. In life skills and in terms of the workforce, you go into almost any company, organization, or store, and the first thing they do is hand you a pack of materials that you have to read, fill out applications, uh, instructions, what to do, what not to do on the job. And so reading skills, you know, are, are going to be necessary for success, not just in a college classroom, but uh, in the workplace and in life as well. There's got to be something easier. Well, you know, anything worthwhile takes commitment. Okay, I could never make working out a habit. I'd have to drive there, change clothes, work out, shower, change clothes again, drive back. I just couldn't get into it. Uh-huh. Well, changing your exercise habits does take work, and so does changing your reading habits. Muscle reading is a great tool, as you'll see, but for it to work, you have to approach reading in a new way. Our reading habits develop over time, beginning with our earliest experiences. For instance, was learning to read easy, or did you struggle? Struggle. Did you like to read books as a child, or did you have to be dragged away from the television? Television. Good experiences tend to build good habits, and vice versa. Often, learning to read more effectively means having to change those well-set patterns, and that's not easy. Now, what gives a habit its influence is that we do it unconsciously, on automatic pilot, as it were. You mean like the way you always adjust your glasses just when you're about to make an important point? I don't do that. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> you just did it a second ago when you talked about being on automatic pilot. Really? <laughs> I never noticed. Well, the good news is that habits can be changed. The first step is awareness. Once you recognize you do things in a certain way, it opens the way for you to make a change. Current reading habit that I want to change probably be how easily I get distracted. I'll be reading a passage or a paragraph, and by the end of the paragraph, I wonder what I had just read because my mind has gone somewhere else. I think that happens when I know it's a chore or a task that I have to do that I don't want to do. So I'm in that mindset. Besides getting distracted, I've also become tired. I'll just read and fall asleep while I'm reading. Then I have to go back to figure out what I had just read and I'll fall asleep again. I just need to motivate myself to just dive into the reading and focus and read through what I have to and retain the information. If I can improve that, uh, that would also help me taking tests. I think anyone who has had any kind of bad habit in his or her life recognizes the fact that when you really want to change that habit, it's not just a question of saying, I want to change the habit. 
I want to quit smoking. I want to stop procrastinating. Uh, I want to start studying ahead of time for tests. And part of the things that we learn in the success course is, I think, number one, recognizing that you have a habit that you want to change. Another great way to help you change your reading habits is by using a matrix like this one. It allows you to chart your progress through each of the nine muscle reading steps for a number of different assignments. Each cell you check is another tiny step toward more efficient and effective reading habits. Suzette, how goes the exercise program? Great, I think. I'm just getting started. Oh, that hurts. But did you stretch first? It says here you should always stretch first. Who does that? Well, you can hurt yourself if you don't stretch first. All right. Plunging right in before taking the time to warm up is pretty common, especially when it comes to reading. Most of us, when faced with a reading assignment, do what we were taught in first grade. You dive right in and read from start to finish. But the first phase of muscle reading, the preview outline questions phase, asks you to hold back and take a few minutes to get the feel of what you're about to read. There you go. You just adjust your glasses again. Ah, well, that's because this is an important point. The three steps in this first phase will put the reading you're about to do in context. Knowing the context will help you digest the information and connect it to what you already know. A human brain is, first of all, a problem-solving machine, and we think that's true of most of the uh, other animals as well. It's not just sitting there ready to get passive information, but it's always jumping, uh, jumping to conclusions. We don't come into the world with a lot of context, except that this is mother and this is the way you nurse and a few things like that. But you can draw the wrong conclusion so easily because uh, the, the context that, that you as an individual bring to it may have the wrong information. That's what the brain is doing all the time. It's using the facts that it has. Uh, now, some people get paid for it. Detective gets, detectives get paid for that. They go into a scene and then they try to work backwards and create how that works. But that's what we're doing all the time. We're like detectives. As detectives, we need to understand the big picture, the context, before we can begin to know what the details mean. Now, to illustrate that, let's do an exercise. It's a little minute mystery that you can solve. Get out a pen and a piece of paper because you want to write this down. John and Mary are found lying on the floor. John is unconscious and Mary is dead. There's broken glass and water on the floor next to the bodies. The questions are, who are John and Mary? Why is John unconscious? How did Mary die? And where are the water and broken glass from? The answer to any of these questions will provide the context for the situation. Then the rest of the answers are easy. Stephen already knows the whole story. Let's see how the others do. Maybe, uh, what is it, a piece of glass? There's a broken glass and a water. Glass? There is There is broken glass mm -hmm. and water on the floor next to the bodies. The water that melted, it was, was like, ice. it used to be ice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it might have something to do with that. Maybe yeah. they fell out of the shower <laughs> through like the glass doors. <laughs> they died. Maybe and the, if you're in a bathroom yeah, and you're locked, locked the and door sealed. locked and sealed. Maybe it's a gas or something. Yeah. It's a what? Gas. gas yeah. A gas. Because everything, everything locked was locked. Yeah. Is it from a drinking glass? No. Is it from a mirror? No. Is it from a window? No. Was the room full of water? No. Did glass oh. fall on his head? Are the names like important? No. So it could have been just like Joseph Peter and Mary. And we gotta find oh, out yeah. why, why we should find out why they're uh, locked and sealed. I don't know. Are they getting away from something? Were they hiding? No. How what? Important? Water's important. Something hit John on the head. Yes. Did Mary drown? No. Do they know each other? Did they know each other before? They had a unique relationship, <laughs> <laughs> but no. Uh, I think it, maybe John's like, what's that called? Like a mortician or one of those doctor people? And he was like, you know, she was brought in. Again, who are John and Mary? <laughs> they're people. Start, no, they're not. Oh, 
There's like nary a fish or something. Yes. There's a fish that fell out of a water tank. Oh, like and thong. John would be a cat? Yes. So who are John and Mary? Cat and fish. And fish. Why is John unconscious? Because he either hit his head or a glass fell on him or something. How did Mary die? She, she undrowned. Undrowned, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where are the water and broken glass from? The glass, the jar, the fish the fishing bowl. Fish bowl. Mary the fish? <laughs> we weren't ready as a group to make that leap of John and Mary cannot possibly be us human beings. We were, we wanted to smash them into a mold. You have to really, really pay attention to the context, especially because if you, if you go ahead and try to figure it out with your own, I guess your own thoughts already, it's kind of not good because you're going to think of a whole new, different answer of what the answer really is. We, we assumed the whole time that they were humans. Um, and I think we make similar assumptions when reading texts. Um, we assume that it's about one thing just because we just don't know what the context of, of the, the whole thing is. Now that you understand the importance of context, here's how muscle reading helps you get the context for your reading. Step one, preview. Remember the textbook reconnaissance you did early in this course? Well, preview means you start your reading with a quick reconnaissance of the pages you're assigned. As you flip through, play the role of a detective. Note the major headings, subheadings, the keywords, and graphics. This will give you the big picture of your assignment. Step two develops that big picture into more detail, an outline. It's an optional step that's especially helpful for difficult material. Write down the title, paragraph headings, and important topics in outline form or in a diagram. It's a little time consuming, but the act of writing it down will help anchor the context in your mind. Step three is perhaps the most important, to write questions. Go through the assignment, pick out the headings and subheadings, see what else piques your interest, then put all these topics in the form of questions. Looking for the answers to these questions while you read will help make the assignment more relevant to you and more interesting. You might find that questions start popping up during your preview or while you're doing the outline. That's fine. You don't have to follow these steps in sequence. Also, many textbooks are designed with preview questions at the beginning of each chapter or review questions at the end. It's okay to compare these questions with your own, but try to write your own first. The idea is to generate questions that are important to you, so you'll have more interest in the assignment. That'll lead to better comprehension and retention and ultimately to a better grade on the test. Okay, now I'm warmed up and I'm ready to build some muscle. Where are the weights? Okay, finally, the nitty gritty. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Which brings us to the second phase of muscle reading. Read, underline, and answers. You start by reading, but this isn't the usual passive process where you read and hope to absorb the information. Remember, you're a detective now, and you're reading with a very specific purpose to answer the questions you developed in stage one. Muscle reading is an active process where you personally interact with the material. Right. So step four is to read, but try to do it in the here and now. That means you need to focus all your attention on the moment you're in. If you're thinking about yesterday's problems or tomorrow's to-do list, it'll be almost impossible to concentrate on the assignment. One thing that will help you stay in the here and now is good posture. When you read, sit up straight and put your feet on the ground. Now, reading the latest novel curled up in bed is fun, but if you need to learn large amounts of information in a hurry, you'll have better luck in a chair sitting up straight. Just like Mom always said. Step five, and you've heard this from us before, Mark up your book as you read. Underline, highlight with colors, make diagrams, scribble in notes, whatever you need to make the important points stand out. Rather than underlining, some people prefer to make notes on a separate piece of paper. That's okay too. Having your own personal notes on the assignment will not only be helpful later when you review, but the act of making them helps plant the information into your memory. When they're reading in order to gain information, information that they're going to have to assimilate and process, the highlighter is important, 
but don't overdo it. You know, I have seen some student textbooks where every single word, every paragraph is highlighted. You know, I explain to them it's too much of a good thing because then how do you know what to review? So I try to teach them to be selective in what they choose to highlight. So how do you know what information is important enough to highlight or underline? Well, you can start with step six of muscle reading, the answers to the questions you developed earlier. Some of those answers will just pop out at you during your first reading. Others may require you to dig in a little deeper to root them out. What are some of the ways that plants reproduce. tend to reproduce? Yeah. Okay. Some of the flowers reproduce by having the bugs go, like they fly and they land on inside the colorful flowers, which attract the bugs' eyes. Uh -huh. And uh, when they land there, they eat the pollen that's inside. And while they're there, they, they get the... Uh, uh, seeds and stuff stuck on their legs so that when they go from flower to flower to, they're fertilizing yeah, the, they're the, fertilizing the seeds. Okay. Another question you know, how would how would water aquatic plants uh, reproduce since you know it's hard for air borne stuff to travel in water. Right. <laughs> how does that work? Um, it's pretty much the same type thing you know it's uh, instead of bugs flying by and landing on the plants and pollinating all the separate plants you've got fish and underwater aquatic animals that do the same thing and as they're swimming along uh -huh. you know they they brush up against the the plants and stuff so oh, and it sticks on them yep. and, then and it's the same way the same, it stick, same way it sticks on the legs of the the bees the and insects. stuff when they're pollinating stuff oh. That's done. <coughs> Wait, it, uh, it says here that you have to do the whole sequence three more times. Three times? Let me see that. Well, repetition is what makes exercise work. The same goes for learning. And people have to learn the number facts. People have to learn the times tables. People have to learn the alphabet. Uh, people have to learn their social security numbers, their driver's licenses. Uh, they have to learn just a myriad of things which are not single events, but they're just general knowledge about the world. The only way that that's going to be well learned is for the information to be studied and repeated again and again and again. So even when you're done reading and you've answered your questions, you're not finished with the assignment until you review what you've learned. That brings up the triple R's of muscle reading. Recite, review, and review again. This phase is crucial because it puts what you've learned in your long-term memory, which is essential to doing well on your exam. You see, it's not a very effective use of your time to read an assignment once and then set it aside until just before the test. When you do that, you're likely to have forgotten most of what you read, and then you'll have to learn everything all over again. So if you make a little time for the triple R's, you'll spend less time studying for the test and you'll know the material better. You do the first R immediately after completing a reading assignment. Recite to yourself the key points of what you've just read. This will include the answers to your questions and any other important topics you've highlighted. Next, review the material within 24 hours of your first reading. This moves the information from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. You don't have to reread the whole assignment. Just flip through the pages and read through your notes and the parts you underlined. Finally, do the same review again, weekly or at least monthly, until your final exam. Now, the more often you review, the more you'll know. If I had old stuff and new stuff, I would tackle the new stuff before reviewing the old stuff. If I got something new, I'd like to work backwards and find something new, and then if it triggers something that I had learned before, then I'd go back and say, oh, you know, does this relate to this or whatever. If it's material that I completely don't understand, then I'd be more likely to go and review because if the new material is completely like complex, uh, because I think that the reason why I don't understand that information is because I haven't built myself up to it. I prioritize my reading in terms of what I know less and of and what I know more of. Like, um, like let's say I have a sociology test and a biology test in one week. I'd probably look over more for my biology test because I'd be more comfortable with my, my knowledge of my sociology class. I usually do review when I'm coming upon a test. 
I usually procrastinate, actually. But if it's something that I'm really, if it's a subject that I'm really interested in, sometimes I'll pay a lot of attention to what I'm learning, what I'm reading, and look over it just for my own personal benefit. Skipping a review is like skipping exercise. The muscle in your reading gets a little flabby without it. But we know it's difficult sometimes to make time for reviews. Now, it may seem that the whole muscle reading process will take more of your time with all that previewing and reviewing, and that's probably true in the short run. But most students find that the extra time they spend on muscle reading is more than offset by the time they save when studying for exams. Still, it may be a challenge to find the time for all those muscle reading steps. For some help, take another look at the time management techniques you learned earlier in this course. You may find some ways to fit muscle reading into your regular study habits. Mm -mm. It's got to be a little bigger. No, not yet. You've got to be doing it for a while. Do I have to? Well, if you want this to be a new habit, yes. There's almost always resistance to changing a habit, and that's certainly true for muscle reading. It asks you to approach your reading in a very different way. For most, that means a major change in reading habits. It takes commitment and practice to change a habit, but there are ways to increase your chances of success. One of the best ways to help yourself make muscle reading a new habit is to use the matrix we showed you earlier. Checking off the steps breaks things into smaller, more manageable pieces and gives you a sense of satisfaction, like a little reward with every check mark. Also, as you do this, you'll get a better feel for which muscle reading techniques work best for you. Measure me. Okay. On um, the matrix, I'm, I'm using more of the techniques now with my reading, with the assignments that I've been doing for school. Um, I'm finding um, that about half of it is helpful because I use it. I've been using some of the techniques already, such as highlighting or underlining, um, like looking over it before I actually do the reading um, or previewing, and then the actual reading, the muscle reading, is, that's all helpful. Um, I use the outline form a few times, and um, I don't find that to be very useful just because it kind of, I think it takes away from my time of actually reading. I did some of the reading before class and it made the lecture a lot more coherent to me and made a lot more sense to me because I did that reading ahead of time and actually I went through and looked through all the main concepts. This was really helpful. My approach to reading from textbooks has completely changed because um, I mean, I personify everything, you know, my car has a name, my bike has a name, you know, I'm surprised that the microwave doesn't, you know, or different, anyway, but so, but what I've, I've never made that kind of a connection with textbooks, and so it's interesting, I mean, it probably sounds really childish, which it is, but since when I can make that connection like it's a person, it's somebody that I care about, you know, to a textbook, then I'm not, I can approach it much more easily and, and uh, actually read which is great. I now write in my textbook. I will even open my textbook when I have a lecture, and if the teacher starts talking about a topic that's talked about in the textbook, I will write in the margins what he is saying so that I have it all together in one spot, as well as my notes. I, nev I did not do that before. In high school, for, sh for sure, you did not touch the textbook with a pencil. I've learned that it's much easier for me now, now and reading, the, reading that and also just doing it, that if I have notes in the text related to what the teacher is saying, related to what we're studying, it makes my studying a lot easier. <laughs> Hey, look at you. Well, wow, let's check this out. <whistles> Looks like your work paid off. Mm -hmm, finally, although I had my doubts. <laughs> Any change in habits is accompanied by some doubts that it's worth the effort. So here are a few tips that may make the difference for you. First, as we said earlier, expect muscle reading to take a little longer at first than your previous method. Changing your reading technique sometimes takes some practice, but it will pay off when it's time to recall what you've read. And that's the whole point, right? So give it some time. 
Another thing to keep in mind, you don't have to use all the muscle reading steps every time you pick up something to read. You can adapt them to fit the situation. For instance, you've got preview, outline, questions, read, underline, answers, and the triple R's. Remember, the outlining step is most useful for complex materials. Uh, <laughs> you can skip it for simpler reading without affecting your results. Nice job, Wayne. I knew you could do it. Thanks. And so can you. Oh, ah, just... Here, work on this one. Okay. Ow. One. Two. Ow. Three.